Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Lathe Skills, a series of quick videos on getting started in machining. This is episode 17, Taps and Dies on the Lathe. This is not a general treatise on taps and dies, we're just going to be talking about how and why you use them on the lathe. If you like this content, uh, go ahead and support me on Patreon. I post uh, exclusive project videos and models and drawings and lots of cool stuff, behind the scenes things, just for patrons. Okay, let's dive in. Whoa, 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 why would we ever use a tap or a die on the lathe? I mean, all the cool kids do single point threading and every modern lathe has a lead screw that's synchronized to the drive spindle and that's the defining property of a screw cutting lathe. It's right there in the nave. It's court, I'm fine. Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons that we use taps and dies on the lathe. Well, first and foremost, because it's a whole lot quicker to use a tap or a die. If you're cutting threads single point on a small hobbyist machine, you're almost certainly going to have change gears to mess with. Uh, you may have a quick change gearbox of some uh, description for messing with, uh, you know, feed rates, but for actually cutting precision threads, you're going to have to mess with your change gears. And, uh, you know, larger machines uh, have big fancy transmissions in them that save you that trouble. So great if you have one of those, that's super nice. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, dies are going to be a lot quicker for, for cutting threads. Another reason to do it is on small parts. It's often easier to use a die than it is to single point cut something very, very small. Or if you're cutting up to a shoulder and you really, really need to get right up to that shoulder and you don't have space uh, in your design for, uh, for a gap there to, uh, to wind out into when you're single point threading, uh, then uh, there again, uh, the die is going to be your friend. And then on internal threads, taps are going to be your friend for really small holes because you may not be able to get a boring bar with a small enough uh, thread cutting bit or insert on it into a, a small hole. So uh, yeah, taps and dies, very useful actually on the lathe. But a very reasonable next question might be, well, I have taps and dies and I have a workbench and taps and dies work fine on my workbench. Why would I bother with doing them on the lathe? Well, if you recall all the way back in episode one of this series on theory, uh, the superpower of machine tools is keeping everything square. So if we can manage to somehow fixture this die in, in the lathe using the powers of the lathe to hold it square to our work, we will end up with threads that are extremely straight and square to the stock. For example, on this uh, traditional wobbler steam engine, the pivot for the cylinder is threaded in. So as you can see, these threads need to be extremely parallel to that stock because those threads are establishing the relationship between the frame of the steam engine and this pivoting bearing surface of the cylinder. And this is the sealing surface for the steam. So uh, if this thread isn't extremely square, then that surface isn't going to ride properly on there, on the frame there, and uh, the piston will fall out and chaos ensues. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, piston has to be square, threads straight. Yeah, man, that take was perfect. And while you can use things like tapping guides and so on to help keep things straight while you're tapping on the bench, uh, you will never get it as straight with any of those methods as your threads will be when cut on the lathe. Starting with taps then, uh, I mentioned that the key to this operation is to find a way to fixture the tap in the lathe. And uh, so that boils down to holding the tap in the tailstock because of course the stock is in the chuck as is tradition. And so we need a way to fixture this guy in the tailstock. So uh, it, it boils down to what type of tap you have. Taps come in a couple of different construction methods, if you will. So uh, what we need is a way to support the back of the tap in a way that uh, keeps it on the center line of the spindle in order to, to give that nice straight thread that we're, that we're after. Now, larger and higher quality taps will have a center in the back of them. And in fact, there's a center in the other end as well, because these guys are made between centers. That's one of the marks of a high quality tap. And uh, if you do happen to have that, then you can use a center in the tailstock uh, in that center on the tap. And then that's going to guarantee that your tap stays on the spindle axis of the lathe. So that's a great option. Now, a lot of smaller uh, and or less expensive taps do not have centers in them. So for these guys, we have to hold them or fixture them somehow with either the square or the round portion of the back of the tap. And we'll look at a couple of ways to do that in a minute. And another arrangement that you might see on smaller taps is a point on the back, because if there isn't physically space for uh, an indentation on the back, then uh, they'll put a point on it. And so if you have a reverse center for your tailstock, then you can use this guy the same way as we did with the, uh, the center in the big tap. Now, before we do any tapping on the lathe, of course, uh, you need to drill the hole to the tapping drill size, just like you would in any other type of tapping operation. And uh, if you're working in metric, this is super easy. You just subtract the pitch from the diameter. So if you're 
doing an M5 by 0.75 thread, uh, then you're just going to go 5 minus 0.75, which gives you 4.25, and that's your tapping drill. Super easy, one of the nice things about metric. And if you're a lowly imperial machinist, then you put one of these ridiculous charts on your wall and you look at it a lot. For the sake of argument, I'm going to be cutting a quarter 20 thread in this material, and I've consulted my ridiculous chart, and it told me I need either a number 7 or a 7 30 seconds tapping drill, depending on the tolerance that I want on this thread. So we've gone ahead and done that. Next, we need three things. We need a way to hold the tap on the center axis of the spindle, like so, and we need a way to apply pressure to the back of the tap so that it can cut its way in, and we need a way to rotate the tap. If you're using a tap with centers in it, then a great way to support it on the axis of the lathe is with a center in your tailstock. So you can just bring that guy up, and Bob's your uncle, that guy's gonna stay perfectly on the center axis. Now to turn the tap, you can either put an open-backed style tap wrench on here, like a greenfield, or you can also just use a wrench on there. That works just fine. And then to apply pressure to the back of the tap while we turn it, we can just use the hand wheel on the tailstock. Now, there's a catch here though, if we try to do this right now, the spindle is going to turn. So we have to have a way to lock down the spindle. Now if you have a, uh, a larger machine, uh, it's typically going to have a back gear, and a back gear is an easy way to, uh, to lock the spindle so it can't turn when the machine isn't running. However, for a lot of uh, benchtop DC lathes like this one, there is no back gear because it's digital motor control, so uh, they don't need a back gear for lowering the speed, and thus there's no easy way to lock the spindle. So a lot of people will build some sort of a spindle lock, often that goes on the back of the bore behind the machine there. Uh, but uh, I'm going to show you some other ways to deal with the fact that you can't lock the spindle. Now this is my preferred method. So I've got my tap in a tap wrench, and this has to be a high quality tap wrench uh, that has a center on the back. The cheap ones often don't, so make sure you, you do that. And then the tap wrench is going to, uh, along with the center, hold the tap uh, in, on the axis and also give us our way to turn it like we talked about. And then the third job of applying pressure to the back of the tap is going to be done by this guy. This is a spring-loaded tap follower. And uh, you can buy these, uh, or you can just make them, as I've done here. And they're, it's actually a great starter lathe project. They're easy to make. It's just a tube with uh, a, a plunger in the middle that's spring-loaded. And uh, I've made mine to go in a Jacob's Chuck, but uh, if you want to get fancy, you can also put a Morse taper on the back of them so they go directly into your tailstock. But uh, this guy now will go in the back of our tap to hold it on the axis. And then I can just wind in my quill and compress that spring. And uh, I've got about half an inch of travel on mine. And... Uh, that's now going to apply the pressure on the back of our tap wrench. And then as I go, if I need a thread that's deeper than half an inch, then uh, as I approach the end of the travel here, I can just crank in the quill a little more and keep going. As you can see, the great thing about this setup is that now I can either hold the chuck and turn the wrench, or, hold, or turn the chuck and hold the wrench, or do both. And uh, now, presto changeo, I don't need three hands anymore. I can do all of my tapping operation. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And then as you can see, as I go, spring loader tap follower is being my third hand back there. And if you don't have a spring loader tap follower, here's one other way to get around a non-locking spindle. Just throw a piece of wood down on your cross slide or your ways or whatever's handy, rest the tap wrench on it, and then you can apply pressure with your right hand on the back of the center using the, the uh, tailstock quill, and, uh, and then just turn the chuck with your left hand, and you can do your tapping like so, and the tap wrench is going to slide right along that block of wood, and Bob's your uncle. Once again, look mom, only two hands. While we're talking about ways to hold taps, I should uh, mention the elephant in the room, which is, well, why don't you just put it in the Jacob's chuck in your tailstock? 
And, uh, you know, people do do this and, uh, you know, maybe it's fine, but uh, I'm not a huge fan for a couple of reasons. So first of all, either you try to hold it on the square end, but of course this is square and Jacob's checks have three jaws. So there's not really a, a good way to do that. And it's not gonna hold it properly on the axis. So then you're talking about gripping it on the round portion of the tap. And while this might be fine, uh, the tap is by far the hardest piece of steel in your shop. These things are incredibly hard and the jaws on the Jacobs chuck are also very, very hard. So what that means is you've basically got like two pieces of glass trying to hold against each other. So they don't, neither surface bites into the other. And so you have a very poor grip here. So it's gonna be very easy to spin this tap. And uh, honestly, you might even mar up the jaws on your Jacobs chuck because taps are, as a rule, incredibly hard. And because that grip isn't very good, when you try to apply pressure with the quill, the tap is gonna to tend to slide in those jaws and uh, it's just gonna get pushed in, especially if you're uh, turning a tough material. So, uh, you know, people do do this uh, and uh, some, in some cases it's fine, uh, but it's not my, not my preference. Okay, let's talk dies now. And uh, thread cutting dies uh, are generally round, uh, although sometimes they are hexagonal. Uh, oftentimes the hexagonal ones are uh, cleanup or repair dies, uh, or sometimes called mechanics dies but uh, not always, so uh, check what you're buying. But uh, most of the time they will be round and they will have little indentations around them for various ways of holding them. And uh, the nicer ones will also have a, a screw in them to uh, adjust a gap here to account for wear. And these guys come in a couple of different sizes. This is your basic one inch die, which is the most common. And they also come in many sizes that are larger than this as well for, for bigger threads and bigger machines. And if you're into hobby or model engineering, you're likely to encounter these 13 16 diameter dies, which are for your smaller uh, crazy model engineer threads, uh, like your 31640 and uh, other uh, really tiny little things. Now, once again, we have our same three problems. We need a way to hold this die on the axis of the lathe. We need a way to turn it and we need a way to apply pressure to the back. Now, if you have a lathe that can lock the spindle either with a back gear or other means, uh, then it's pretty straightforward. You just put this guy in a, in a die wrench and now all we need, a way, all we need is a way to keep it uh, on the work and have some pressure applied to the back. There's a couple of easy ways to do that. Uh, one is uh, just using the, the face of your uh, tailstock quill or the face of your Jacob's chuck with the jaws retracted because those are gonna be machined surfaces. And so they will keep the die straight and allow you to apply pressure to the back and you can just push it on as you go. Now, not all die wrenches are created equal. So here's a weird one that I happen to have for holding hexagonal dies. And uh, it doesn't have a flat back on it, so I can't use that technique, but it does have a big old hole in the middle. So putting a center in the lathe then actually allows me to just seat that guy in there. And now I can apply pressure to the back of the, that wrench and it's gonna hold it square to the work. And if you can't lock your spindle, the block of wood trick that I showed you with taps works equally well with the die wrench. Simply rest the handle on the block of wood. And as this guy pulls itself down the work, it's gonna slide. So you've got one hand on the chuck and one hand on the tailstock hand wheel, applying pressure to the back and you get, you get your job done with just two hands. Now, regardless of whether you can lock your spindle, uh, this is actually my favorite way to use the die. And this, this is a tailstock die holder. And once again, you can buy these, but uh, this is a shop made one. And once again, this is an excellent beginner lathe project because it's uh, just a, a very simple bit of geometry. And these work much like you would expect. There is a hole down the middle, which allows it to sit on this shaft and also allows the work to pass through. And the dies just drop in there. And then there are set screws that tighten on those dimples that are on the outsides of the round dies that I showed you. And then this guy just slides on here. And then this guy has a handle that slides in and uh, the whole thing slides on that shaft. And now we've got all our jobs covered. We've got one hand on the chuck turning the work, got the other hand here either ho holding or turning our die. And then the die is pulling itself down the work. And so it's just gonna slide on the shaft here. And if you do need to apply pressure, you can just crank your quill forward and it's gonna hit this shaft on the inside here and allow you to use that shaft to apply pressure on to the work. That can help get the die started sometimes. And in fact, getting the die started is probably the main gotcha with using dies on the lathe. Uh, you know, dies are multi-point cutting tools, unlike single point threading, which is a single point, it's right there in the name. So uh, these guys are, are always gonna be uh, a little bit harder working. And as a result, they have to have looser tolerances. And to that end, when you're turning the major diameter in preparation for cutting the threads, uh, you don't wanna go right to the major diameter of the die in a lot of materials, uh, because you're gonna have a lot of trouble getting the die to start. Now it depends on the material, but for soft things like brass, this can be especially problematic because uh, the, the first 
set of teeth in the die is having to do a lot of work. It's having to start cutting that thread and then that first thread has to be strong enough to pull all the other teeth into the work to finish the cutting. And that gets harder and harder as the die starts pulling in until all the teeth are engaged. So that first thread really wants to tear out. Uh, and that's really a problem with uh, soft materials. So uh, sometimes tapering the end can help. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, in my experience, it doesn't help that much. Uh, so what does help is turning the material a couple of thou under the major diameter. Okay, I've got my major diameter turned 5 thou under 250, which is what I need for my major diameter for my quarter 20 die. And I got that set up in my tailstock die holder. And I got a little cutting fluid on there and a little bit of pressure to get that guy started. And then once that first thread catches, we are off to the races. So as you can see, two hands, no problem. All right, so here's our nicely cut threads. And I mentioned earlier that one of the advantages of using a die on the lathe is it allows you to cut threads right up to a shoulder if you need to. But in order to do that, you need to make sure you have the right kind of die. Most dies will have two sides. One side, usually the side with the writing on it, the first couple of threads are tapered, and then the threads on the other side are not. See, there's cutting teeth all the way flush with the bottom of the die. So what you can do then is start with this side facing the work because it's easier to get the thread started and you cut that in. And then once you get in as far as you can with this side, you flip the die over in the wrench or in the die holder and then you wind it back on there. And then those little teeth right there will cut that thread right up to the shoulder. So that's a little superpower that dies have that is much harder to do with single point threading. So we've learned that using taps and dies on the lathe is easy and cuts very straight and nice threads. Uh, the question is, why would you ever not do it this way? What, what's the point of single point threading if we have great tools like this? Well, uh, the key is right there in the name. These tools are all multi-point cutting tools. So uh, you've got all these teeth on the tap for them, uh, all cutting at once, and then you've got the same thing. You've got three sets of teeth all cutting at once on the die, and that's a lot of tool pressure. And in order to make that work, you have to have greater tolerances. So your drill size for a tap is always going to be uh, a little bit sloppier than it should be for a, a really precise machinist fitting thread. And then the same for the die, as you saw here, I had to turn this guy 5 thou under in order to get the die to start. So that's 5 thou of slop that's now built into my thread. So when you need that really precise machinist fit thread, like for certain kinds of tooling or, you know, just because you want to make it beautiful, uh, single point threading is going to allow you to, ch to achieve very, very precise fits. That's quite a beautiful thing, but it is a lot of work to set up and uh, takes a lot more skill. However, it is incredibly sexy, so we are going to talk about single point threading in a later video. But that's all for this one. Thanks for watching. Consider supporting me on Patreon, and we will see you next time.